And now, it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Jeff Canarsi. We're going to get into the next edition of the Kennedy crime family. So when we left left off two weeks ago, uh, John F. Kennedy was preparing to run for the White House. Not only had he stormed his way throughout the Democratic circles, but his father, Joe, had essentially pulled the cards for him. Uh, John Kennedy knew all along he would need the Midwest to rally for him, and he knew southern states would have to come out in big numbers for him. One of the chief concerns inside the Kennedy camp was the votes from the South because Kennedy was Catholic and many of the Southern voters were very anti-Catholic. But Kennedy would give a rousing speech about the separation from church and state, hoping that that would alleviate some of the Southern concerns about his religion. While Kennedy had a lot on his plate, there was a lot going against him for starters. Bobby Kennedy had created a lot of enemies in Washington. Bobby had published a book in 1960 entitled The Enemy Within, which essentially blasted the unions and organized crime. And if that turned the heads of the mafia, like it basically turned the heads of the mafia like the exorcist. But not many would say anything. And I think a lot of the concerns that the mafia had was somewhat placated by the promises from Joe Kennedy that if John were to be elected, with, of course, the help from the mafia, especially in those wards where Kennedy was behind, then Bobby would go quiet and John would do do all in his power to shut down investigations and more. The problem with that, however, was J. Edgar Hoover, who really all along left the mafia alone until the infamous Appalachian incident. And that ended up having sort of forced his hand into making some general concessions. The fact is, Bobby wanted everybody prosecuted, especially from those McClellan hearings. And when J. Edgar Hoover ignored his stammering about prosecution, it just created a nasty, nasty relationship between the two, which both Joe Kennedy and John wanted Bobby to fix. There was a lot to worry about, too, considering Kennedy was knocking every broad that came within three feet of him. And then there was the not so well kept secret that Kennedy had Addison's disease. So while Bobby was a pissant in every single form and fashion, he also, in his own way, was trying to protect his brother. But rather than do things the silent way, he was brash, insulting, and pretty much an uppity prick about everything. So while Kennedy didn't like Lyndon Johnson at all, he brought him into the fold because he knew that when he became president, Johnson, or prior to that, uh, He knew that he needed Southern votes, so bringing Johnson on helped the voting process. But at the end of the day, it wouldn't matter because Johnson would just be another face in the crowd with little say and input on anything that John F. Kennedy wanted to do. Plus, bringing Johnson into the fold would almost secure, like I said earlier, those needed votes in the South. So when we talked last week or the week before, uh, we know that Bobby was irate. That Kennedy chose Johnson as his running mate and fumed and seethed at that idea, almost accusing his brother of not having any intelligence because Bobby feared that Johnson would use Kennedy and that Johnson had already leaked out the information to the press about Kennedy having Addison's disease. The reality is Johnson probably did out him. He probably did give up that information. But this is a situation where, you know, you bring Johnson in because by proxy, you can somewhat control him. You bring him in, the optics look good to the Southerners, but then you just keep him outside the circle of trust. And looking back, it was the worst decision that he ever made. And perhaps on many levels, uh, Bobby Kennedy was right all along about not trusting Lyndon Johnson. Because remember, Bobby had gone to see Johnson in his hotel room, and the two got into their first of some three dozen knockdown screaming matches. By allowing Bobby to go and deliver messages to Johnson, John Kennedy is somewhat insulating himself. 
In any event, Johnson was uh, in whether or not Bobby liked it or not. Uh, maybe there were some early warnings, too, that Johnson was not well liked for a lot of different reasons. So after he is named running mate, uh, George Meany of the AFL-CIO president basically called out Johnson as the arch nemesis for organized labor. So already from Jump Street, people were not exactly thrilled at the decisions that John F. Kennedy was making. We talked, we talked the other week about how vote rigging had been set up in West Virginia and other places, and this would be the same tactic used for the presidential voting system. However, I want to step back to Frank Sinatra for a second. And the reason why Frank was so integral to the mafia and to the Kennedys, as we said, was because he made the introductions. And one of the big concerns, other than his Catholic faith and his father's past and his brother's behavior, was those unions. Remember, Kennedy uh, blasted the unions nonstop when he was a senator. Bobby Kennedy went after the unions. Bobby's antics infuriated the unions. And that is exactly why Sam Giancana and others getting involved was so important. With the mob pushing the unions, they wouldn't vote for Kennedy. Kennedy. So if the mo- so if the mafia isn't pushing the unions, forget about it. Especially when you consider Jimmy Hoffa. Um. And and so you might ask, well, what about Jimmy Hoffa? Because surely he would not have voted for Kennedy or allowed the unions to go that route, or at least to vote that route. He would have done everything to stop it. And you'd be right in asking that question and also thinking that as well. In 1957, as you know, obviously, uh, Hoffa was basically voted out as president. And the reason was because he was facing a major criminal investigation as a result of Bobby's little witch hunting drama called the McClellan hearings. On March 14th of 57, Jimmy Hoffa attempted to bribe an aide to the select committee and got caught basically red handed. He how how he would, however, deny all those charges and somehow would be acquitted of those charges. However, that action just propelled indictment after indictment, arrest after arrest, and led to dozens of investigations. Uh, Hoffa had warned the mafia not to trust those fucking Kennedys under any circumstances, but it fell on deaf ears because the end the end of the line for the mob was we can control a president. And that's what we want to do. Why they believed that, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, so because Hoffa was out as president and wouldn't be elected until 1961, reelected, it meant that Hoffa had zero sway within the unions. And because of those investigations, Hoffa really becomes a pariah amongst everybody. He was just too hot. He was a big target and nobody wanted him meddling into their business. <coughs> uh, those unions, though. The Kennedys needed that vote, and it was just as important as the votes in the South. And believe me, had Hoffa still been the president of the union, I do not think there is any way they would have voted Democrat. I just don't think they would have. And I think there was just too many hard feelings. And they didn't want oversight into the unions. So Sinatra would go to work putting together huge benefits for JFK. Hollywood donor dinners, radio ads, and the Rat Pack was front and center for all of it. Dean Martin, who hated John Kennedy, begrudgingly helped, as did Sammy Davis Jr. However, he would be in for a shock as the Kennedys desperately wanted Frank to step in and stop the marriage between Sammy Davis Jr. and the white model, my Brit. Um, Joe Kennedy especially was infuriated that there was an inter- interracial marriage. They didn't like it, and they did everything they could to try to force Frank to stop them from getting married, so much for the Kennedys being all about civil rights. They would even put pressure on Sinatra to either force Sammy to move his wedding date or else, because the wedding date was very close to the voting. Uh, The nuptials infuriated the Kennedys so much that they disinvited Sammy Davis Jr. to the inauguration performance a move that hurt him deeply and also infuriated Sinatra to no end. Dean Martin, on his part, refused to help or do anything at that point after that. Uh, He was slated to be at the inauguration ball, which he refused to do. Uh, But Sinatra really had no choice because he was the one that would set the whole entire function up. But because of the pressure, Sammy would actually end up changing the date of his nuptials till after the election because the Kennedys were afraid that Sammy marrying a white woman would destroy his chances of winning which is repugnant. Uh, And like I said, it shows you just how non-racist the Kennedys were. So even so, Sammy Davis and Dean and the rest of Hollywood would pony up for Kennedy at some of these donor dinners. 
So Sinatra goes all in. He lends his private jet to Kennedy so he could fly in style. While Sinatra was jet setting back and forth from Sin City, oftentimes him and John Kennedy would meet out west for some booths, broads, and debauchery. It was through Sinatra that JFK meets Marilyn Monroe, Judith Exner Campbell, and a million other broads that he would bang. Bobby, on his part, would also bang Marilyn Monroe and other starlets as well. But he didn't seem to have any sort of issue with Sinatra then, that he didn't have any issue with his boozing, his carousing, or his friends at that time. But this would change very quickly. Sinatra would even revamp his home in the desert so that when JFK came, came to town, it would be like the Western White House. Sinatra had a helipad installed, changed the entire dynamic of the home, and even had the home outfitted with separate phone lines and additional amenities for the Secret Service. But he would be totally embarrassed when JFK would go and stay at Bing Crosby's house, who Sinatra seethed, was a fucking bum Republican. If Sinatra ever needed a sign that the Kennedys were loyal to one name, and one name only, it was then. So as the presidential campaign kicked off, and Sinatra was busy working his magic in Hollywood, Bobby begins trying to downplay <coughs> their Catholic faith during the primary. But he would use that in, in the general election, taking almost an, uh, almost an aggressive stance. So prior to the presidential campaign, he wasn't very aggressive about it. You know, it is what it is. We're Catholic. But once he's running for president, he really begins to get aggressive about it. John's campaign, once again, would be run by Bobby and others, but was completely funded by Joe Kennedy. And we know Kennedy would win the nomination and would bring in Lyndon Johnson as his running mate, as we said earlier. At the beginning of the fall election campaign, it was obvious that Kennedy would be taking on Richard Nixon, who was ahead in the polls at that point by six points. And the major issues were getting the economy stimul stimulated again, the Cuban Revolution, and whether or not the Soviets had surpassed the Americans in space and missile programs. His faith really became a hot button topic. And Kennedy, sensing that this was going to be the case, would say, I am not a Catholic candidate for president. I am the Demo Democratic Party candidate for president who also just happens to be a Catholic. I do not speak for my church, nor does my church speak for me. Protestant speakers went after Kennedy's religion almost nonstop. It was almost unrelenting, and this is one of the core reasons why Kennedy needed the mob so bad. The first few debates against Nixon would, would be coming, and in that first debate, Nixon almost, uh, in, in some ways, just looked off kilter. He didn't look into the camera. He veered off into the distance. Kennedy, on his end, looked relaxed, almost subdued, and that may have had to do with the amount of painkillers that he had been given prior to that debate. Uh, Kennedy had a big pill problem, a big painkiller, big painkiller problem. Uh, Kennedy daily received shots for Addison's disease and was often on some sort of painkillers for his back injury. The visual difference was stark because those who watched the televised deba debate felt that John F. Kennedy would won, whereas those who just listened to the debate on the radio felt that Nixon had won. So everything um, was optics. Uh, for Kennedy, the Southern voters who watched were abjectly against Kennedy and began to see a different side to Kennedy. And the optics of Johnson certainly didn't hurt his chances either. Uh, for the most part, this was the first election in United States history in which television played a significant role in politics. The one thing or facet that helped Kennedy with the African-American vote is that one month after making the speech about separation between church and state, Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested and jailed in Atlanta. Uh, King had been arrested for violating his probation when he protest protested at a whites only snack bar. Kennedy, sensing he might make a move, took a big risk politically. Uh, he ends up getting involved. And the reason why I say it was a big risk was that he risked infuriating the Southern voters uh, who were all for segregation. Uh, and, and not to stereotype all the Southern white voters, but one of their main stances was segregation. They wanted things segregated. And with Kennedy stepping inside that threshold, he risked upsetting Southern votes. Uh, so most would see it, see through that move as a political optical move, uh, optics sort of move. Uh, and Bobby was allegedly against it completely saying that while they could agree with, uh, while they could agree with the civil rights with the rights of while they could agree with the rights of all, it wasn't worth upsetting Southern voters. John didn't listen and made a call to Georgia Governor Ernest Van Diver and then Judge Oscar Mitchell, in which Kennedy explained 
that there would be riots in the state and that it was better for all to release Dr. King to save the city from burning down. And they would all agree and Dr. King would be arrested, excuse me, released. So after that first debate, Kennedy would gain a few points in the polls. And according to most of those polls, Kennedy would forge ahead of Nixon. But it wasn't by leaps and bounds. It was by two tenths of a vote. When the country would head to the polls that November, nobody would understand just how close it would be. And the national popular vote, Kennedy would win 49.7% to Nixon's 49.5%. In the Electoral College, Kennedy won 303 votes to Nixon's 219. 14 electors from Alabama and Mississippi refused to support Kennedy because of his stance on civil rights and the whole Martin Luther King thing hurt him there. Uh, Mississippi and Alabama would actually vote for Virginia's Harry Bird. It's a funny name, Harry Bird. So as it would turn out historically, uh, the help that Kennedy got from the mob worked. Had he not invested so much money in states, had he not paid off all of the people in West Virginia, this very well might have been a very, very different ending for America. Uh, if you remember when we talked about those voting districts in Cicero, Illinois, and you can go look up those numbers for yourself prior and post, but people came out in record numbers in those Illinois districts for Kennedy, just as Daly and Giancana had promised. Those districts were widely Republican, all went Democrat for some reason. Kennedy would win the election and everybody would fucking celebrate. Uh, and I often wonder, you know, what the mob guys were thinking. I mean, by most accounts, you know, it was all right. We got our man in, but I don't think that they had any fucking idea what Kennedy was about to do to them. So Kennedy becomes the youngest president elected to office uh, of president of the United States. He would be sworn in in January 20th of 61. Kennedy's first act is to restructure how the White House worked. He wanted the White House organized as everything was a branch off of him. It branches off of him. He would hire both experienced and inexperienced people to work with him in the White House. What Kennedy does next stuns everyone. He names his brother, Bobby. Attorney General of the United States. Reality was Bobby had zero experience, but he got the job not because John wanted it or wanted to give it to him. In fact, John didn't want to give it to him at all. However, up Uncle Clobbercrotch, Joe Kennedy demanded that Bobby be named Attorney General, uh, which is should be no shock to anybody. The Senate Judiciary Committee didn't want to approve Bobby, feeling that he was not experienced, but for some odd reason. His mortal enemy, Lyndon Johnson, was prodded to help, and he stepped in, and he backs Bobby Kennedy. And if you thought that Bobby was done telling his brother what to do, you'd be totally wrong. And it was Bobby who not long afterwards told his brother that he could not name William Fulbright Secretary of State. When, asked, when, when JFK asked Bobby why, Bobby explains that Fulbright, while he knew foreign politics, was a white supremacist and believed in segregation. And it would cost him black votes. Unbelievable. <laughs> Politicians in Washington also worried that Bobby Kennedy had way too much power. It was one thing that they were related, but everybody knew that Bobby was running around telling JFK what to do and how to do it, which was not his job. Now, I, I'm not going to cover, obviously, uh, Kennedy's accolades because it's not integral to what we're talking about. So I'm going to sort of bob past the Berlin crisis of 61. So feel free if you want to go look that up for yourself. But Kennedy walked into office with some major things going on, especially with the Soviets, Berlin, and then Cuba. And then civil rights was about to get very, very, very nasty. And Kennedy does almost an immediate about face. Which, many in Washington, which made many in Washington, especially white Southerners, irate, especially those who had backed him because they thought that he would be for segregation. So as I said, Kennedy, at the end of the day, didn't really give a fuck about civil rights, but he knew which political plot points to hit, and he would make that his crusade after the fact. And it was basically telling those who supported him to fuck off after he got their votes. That's essentially what it was. Uh, many Southern Democrats and Republicans were not happy with Kennedy and with Bobby posturing as the poster boy for the new sheriff in town, eyebrows began to raise. So at the end of the first year, uh, early signs of the Cold War were coming and Kennedy was pretty much enraging everybody in the Senate um, who worried that he wasn't skilled enough to take on Russia. However, for the mafia, 
something else began to happen. Bobby almost immediately begins to go after the mafia and the unions again. In fact, in that first year, convictions against mobsters went up 800%. Bobby had changed how the attorney general's office operates. Uh, uh, Originally, usually the FBI and the attorney general had worked hand in hand, but Bobby would change that. He said that J. Edgar Hoover worked for him and that he would have a special buzzer installed on his desk, which would go off on Hoover's office, telling him that he was needed. Bobby didn't want to hear anything Hoover had to say, but was rather bossy and told him how things were going to go. In one meeting, Hoover explained to Bobby that organized crime wasn't the top of the list of problems that the country had, and they should be and should be focusing on the Soviets and uh, communism, which he felt was more pressing. Kennedy would tell Hoover that organized crime was the biggest problem in America, starting with the mafia and Jimmy Hoffa. Hoover attempted to explain to him that Hoffa was not a communist, but Kennedy laughed and threw him out of his office. So any attempt J. Edgar Hoover tried to make with Bobby saying, this isn't really where the focus should be, Bobby didn't give a fuck. Bobby would be unrelentless with the mafia and everybody who had helped John Kennedy win the election. Uh, and, and, and everybody that was involved in that was going to be slated for public humiliation and indictments. Sam Giancana was especially fucking mad. Giancana took out his anger on Frank Sinatra and blamed him for the entire thing. Giancana knew that Sinatra was tight with Peter Lawford, who was married to Pat Kennedy, and he presses Sinatra to get a message to the president to knock it off or else. Sinatra, on his end, knew it wasn't his fault, but he was embarrassed because he had been the mob's middleman in this entire fiasco. So Sinatra places a call to Peter Lawford who he basically asked Peter Lawford to come out and see him in Palm Springs the following week. Now, keep in mind, Sinatra was still having his Palm Springs Kennedy house finished. Almost as soon as Kennedy won the presidency, he's thrown aside. It turns out it was Bobby who put a stop to that immediately. Uh, One of the issues and one of the narratives, which has been stated wrongly, is that Hoover went to Bobby and explained that Sinatra was hooked up with hoodlums and that they had wiretaps with Judith Exner Campbell and Giancana both talking to Kennedy on the phone. Um, I have never believed that Hoover had those tapes because if he did, believe me, he would have used that against Bobby and put Bobby in his fucking place immediately. That's exactly what he would have done. The truth is is that JFK stupidly put a taping device in his office and Bobby and a few others had access to that. It was Bobby who picked up on those tapes and in a curse-filled tirade told John, if the public finds out that you're fucking other women, your presidency is over. If they find out how we use the mafia in voting districts, it's over. You have to cut ties to Frank Sinatra immediately. Jackie Kennedy also fumed over Sinatra because she knew that Sinatra was the link between JFK fucking starlets. And a side note to all of that is Sinatra had affairs with both Pat and Jackie Kennedy. So anyway, uh, so a wiretap ends up getting put on Sinatra's phone and Bobby finds out that Sinatra was on the phone with someone talking about a scheme to have sex with Patricia Kennedy in order to get an inside track to get John to get Bobby to lay off the mafia. At least that's what Bobby told John. But in all the research that I did, the majority of those files you can actually get access to. And there was never a mention of Sinatra talking about that. So I believe it's likely a load of shit designed by Bobby to just sort of get John away from him. And all, you know, like I said, all this was, was Bobby doing as he was told by Joe. Joe Kennedy was leading the ship. They had all used the mafia. They had used Sinatra and they had gotten what they wanted. Therefore, They needed to insulate themselves. They needed Peter Lawford, who they never really liked, to rid them of Sinatra and immediately. So Peter Lawford, who by all accounts is a great actor and a lush uh, and a womanizer, was sent to deliver the news to Sinatra. He would arrive at Sinatra's Palm Springs compound. Sinatra was running around making sure that all the construction was coming along as quick as possible. And John was due to be out in L.A. in a month's time. Lawford sat down and explained that John was going to be staying at Bing Crosby's. Crosby was a Republican. Sinatra blows a fucking gasket and begins running around telling all the construction workers to leave and starts using a sledgehammer on all of the walls. He actually had installed a plaque on the wall stating that John F. Kennedy slept here and with the date. He rips it off the wall and begins screaming, ranting, and raving. If Lawford was worried about... If Lawford was worried, the next few sentences out of his mouth would end their relationship for the rest of their lives. 
Lawford explained, or excuse me, Lawford was basically used by the Kennedys to send bad news. So Lawford goes on to explain that Bobby had gotten in John's ear and that they could no longer be associated with him because of his mob friends. Sinatra blows another gasket, screaming at Lawford that his friends got the got that prick elected, and if Bobby didn't stop his witch hunting, there would be consequences for all of them. Lawford apologized and blamed, but basically blamed it on Bobby being an overbearing prick, and that he was sure that John would actually meet him secretly out west when Bobby wasn't around. But for Sinatra, it was like a slap in the face, and he threw Peter Lawford off his property and never ever spoke to him again. Uh, and in fact, Peter Lawford's acting career was over that day because Sinatra made sure he couldn't get a fucking job. And Sinatra was the type of guy, you know, you crossed him, you were done. You were a ghost to him. And if Sinatra ever had any reservations about Lawford being his friend or in his inner circle again, the death of Marilyn Monroe would totally destroy that. And, and we may touch on that uh, on this show. I'm not, I'm not sure if I want to cover that. So while Sinatra was hurt, he had a much bigger problem. He was drawing the ire of Sam Giancana. Giancana needed somebody to blame, and Sinatra was the target of his rage. Sinatra was supposed to do a benefit out in Chicago with Dean and Sammy for Dismiss House, but had decided not to go. He canceled it, and that only infuriated Giancana even more. And on an intercepted wiretap, Giancana is talking about wanting to kill Dean Martin and Sinatra. He wants them dead. The problem is Giancana didn't have that power, and when Accardo and Rica find out, they put Giancana in his place immediately and explained that Sinatra was absolutely untouchable because he was one of them, which just meant he's a friend of ours. You're not going to do that. This is not his fault. So there was a lot of drama to go around for the mob. They're reeling over Appalachian, the McClellan hearings, and now Bobby is going to go after everybody. Bobby had only been limited because of Hoover refusing to prosecute guys. But now that Bobby was the attorney general, he could do whatever the fuck he wanted. Nobody was going to stop. A lot of outsiders felt that Bobby was just settling old scores, uh, and it was a personal issue. However, the mob didn't see it that way. They saw it as a personal, personal persecution in order for the Kennedys to hide their secrets. In 1961, after Bobby is named attorney general, Bob Morgenthau was named the top federal prosecutor in Manhattan in the Southern District of New York. Morgenthau, along with Bobby, launched a plan to dismantle all of organized crime in America. It was the beginning of a massive shitstorm. And so, uh, you know, um, we're going to, I think, stop right there, uh, believe it or not, uh, for this week. Sorry, I'm adjusting my notes here. One second, guys. Sorry about that. Um, blah, 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 blah. Sorry about that. I totally lost my place. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, Basically, you know, uh, we're going to stop right there. And, and here's why, because next week, Bobby is going to launch his war on the mafia. The mob is getting pissed beyond pissed. Not only are they being assailed, but Bobby, not to be intimidated, has New Orleans mob boss Carlos Marcello kidnapped, thrown on a plane, and Marcello is going to be tossed out of the plane with a parachute over Guatemala. The hope was that Marcello would never come back. Despite Bobby's hope, a very angry and infuriated Carlos Marcello walks through the jungles for days and finds his way back to American shores with one thing on his mind, killing both of the Kennedys. Uh, and he wouldn't be the only one. Other bosses begin to talk about the problems that Bobby is causing. They want both of them dead and for a lot of good reasons. John is sadly going to take the blame for everything, and that's because he lacked the balls to put his brother in his place. Sadly, uh, a mobster would be caught, <coughs> excuse me, a mobster would be caught on wiretap a few months after Kennedy's assassination saying, we whacked the wrong Kennedy. And oddly, we are about to see some strange events take place as the Cold War begins, the Cuban Missile Crisis begins, and for some odd fucking reason, the CIA turns to the mafia for help with ridding themselves of Fidel Castro. Why on earth the mafia even allowed the Kennedys to approach them after what Bobby has started doing blows my fucking mind. But I think there was a lot at play there, and I also think that Bobby was unaware. But I don't know. We're going to have to debate that. So next week, a lot is going to happen, and it's all going to come to a crescendo of the 35th president of the United States getting whacked in broad daylight. It's also going to lead to Bobby Kennedy getting whacked, too. And if you buy the Sirhan Sirhan thing, you'd be nuts because Kennedy was actually shot from behind. Bobby, not from the front. 
There are going to be a lot of players, a lot of scheming, and we aren't going to get into all of those conspir conspiracy theories. But when it comes to the mafia or any involvement, we're going to cover that in detail and try to give you the backgrounds. But ultimately, and not to spoil this for you now, but the mafia didn't kill John F. Kennedy. The CIA did. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Justifiable, and some reasons aren't. But as I said, I only wanted to cover this from the mob's perspective. And we'll probably end up doing a live show discussing the theories just for fun. But I just wanted to give you the things that nobody usually discusses. So with all of that being said, come back next week for another episode of the Kennedy Crime Family. Uh, we may be, uh, maybe one more show left, maybe two. Uh, I do hope that you have enjoyed the series, at least learn something from it. And uh, reach out to me and let me know what you think. Mobtalkradioshow at gmail.com. In the meantime, have a beautiful weekend. Uh, look out, it's hot everywhere. It's hot everywhere. Uh, but thanks for tuning in. We'll see everybody. And welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We are going to get into the Kennedy crime family yet again. And I think, logically looking at what I'm, I'm doing today, we probably have two more episodes, and then we'll wrap it up on a YouTube Live with the JFK assassination. And I'm not going to do the whole conspiracy thing, but we'll, we'll indulge that for a little bit. So when we left off last week, uh, JFK had been elected to office, uh, the president of the United States. He didn't win in large numbers, but literally 0.2%, which, you know, as history tells us, was the closest presidential race, excuse me, race in history. While JFK, you know, uh, has used by proxy the mafia to help him in, you know, desperate voting districts in the South and in the Midwest, especially local municipalities in Illinois. Like I said, go back and look at how Cicero, Illinois voted prior and then then. Uh, it's astonishing, and, and the fix was definitely it. Shortly after taking office, his father demands that he name Bobby Attorney General. John didn't want Bobby as the Attorney General for a lot of different reasons, and I suspect the deeper-rooted issue is that Bobby was an overbearing know-it-all. And as long as Bobby was around, jo around, John couldn't totally philander and do the things that he wanted to do that he had always done. Uh, John sadly needed a babysitter, and Joe Kennedy knew that Bobby would do that. And it was John's way of trying to get the hell away from his father and his cronies. The problem is, Joe Kennedy wouldn't let it go. He didn't know how to let go. To him, it was his presidency. It was his accolade, not his son's. And you don't have to look too deep into this, to this sort of the the psychological, psychological aspects of what would have to see it. It, it. The easy way is his father just couldn't stop fucking meddling. Because look what happened after his son is murdered. He's dead within, what, a couple of months, a year or two? So, but prior to that vote, Bobby mends fences with Johnson and Hoover at the behest of John and Joe. But it was simply just a window dressing more than anything because not long after that, or not long being named after being named attorney general, he launches into his anti-mafia bullshit. And what confuses me, and what probably confuses you, is why, why on earth would the mafia have a single fucking thing to do with the Kennedys after Bar Bobby started his witch hunting? Why would they turn back around and then help with the Castro shit? Why believe anything at that point the Kennedys had to say? However, if you look close, as soon as the Cuban issue began to rise, Bobby begins to let go of that witch hunt. So you could control Bobby then, but not prior? The reality is, Joe Kennedy used the mafia and had zero intention of keeping his word. And his belief was, and astutely so, if you use people for what you need to get where you need to go, then you can simply turn on them and what the fuck can they really do? What the mafia should have done is go right to Hyannisport and put six in the back of Joe Kennedy's fucking head. That would have at least let the Kennedys know that at the end of the day, the words that come from your mouth, you will be held accountable for. But to answer the earlier question about why would the mob trust them again? That I don't know. I don't understand. But the only thing that I can kind of tell you is this. Number one, Bobby did not know that John through the CIA had backdoored, back channeled the mafia about the Castro ship. Bobby didn't find out till after it was already underway. He had no clue. They hid that from him. 
They completely, and, and some of you may say, well, that's bullshit. How could they hide that for him? They did because they knew they needed help. And I'm sure that the promise that was made again was, well, we're sorry, Bobby did what he did. We're, we're going to make sure this never happens again. It's another lie. And when Bobby finds out that organized crime isn't involved in an assassination plot to Cuba, he goes fucking berserk on his brother and everybody else. But he did not know in the very beginning that information was kept way the fuck away from him because they knew what he would do. Uh, so I'm sure, you know, at some point in those circles, uh, you know, in, in mob circles, it was probably discussed about killing Joe Kennedy, but they knew if they moved on Joe Kennedy, the amount of sheer bat shit, crazy antics Bobby would pull would be unrelenting and unwavering. I still would have done it, to be honest with you. I would have just killed him if the decision was mine. But that's why I do this and not that. And I would have tortured that prick for days. Anyway, but not only does Kennedy have issues with the mafia, but he also has issues with inside the government, including Lyndon Johnson and J. Edgar Hoover. The southern side of the fence, one might even say the KKK wanted Kennedy wiped off the fucking planet, too. There were a lot of forces moving back and forth here. And the fact that Kennedy, in many ways, was gerrymandering to African-Americans, infuriated the old Republican racist guard of the Senate and the racist Democrats as well. There was just a lot building against John F. Kennedy. And many of these things were because of his own, bas not just because of his own backstabbing, but also the fact that the little pissant Bobby was running around making threats to everybody, harassing people nonstop and basically bullying the shit out of everybody. This wasn't the type of thing that began that day. It had been going on for a long time, and any hope that John could stop Bobby or would be willing to was shown to them early as a non-starter. Kennedy's first somewhat major issue was the Cold War. Kennedy's foreign policy from day one was against the Soviets. The rhetoric had begun early, and Kennedy would show his moxie by not being bullied or told what to do. Because the stance was getting aggressive, a summit was set with Soviet Premier at the time, Nikita Khrushchev. The problem for Kennedy was that he was reactive, an emotional reactionary guy, and he completely overreacts to Khrushchev, and he overreacts to, he overreacts to a speech that Khrushchev gives. And Khrushchev was basically on Soviet state television, and his speech was meant to play against the, to play to the domestic audiences. But Kennedy was so enraged at Khrushchev's speech, he took it personally, and he felt that Khrushchev was challenging him personally. He looked at it as a schoolyard fight, and it really wasn't. And according to sources, Kennedy stammered around the White House asking what it would take to kill Khrushchev. And these sort of antics raised a lot of eyebrows in the White House and within the Senate, and the CIA especially began to worry that John F. Kennedy was off his fucking rocker. Kennedy, as Kennedy seethed, his actions and reactions raised the stake and the tension going into the Vienna summit of June of 1961. Kennedy's inexperience showed. Khrushchev laughed. He literally laughed at Kennedy's reaction. And he felt that this was a rookie way out of it. You know, this was a rookie way out of his lane, had no idea what he was doing. And he felt that he could teach Kennedy a quick lesson, either by war or on the playground. And Kennedy seething needed the support of foreign leaders. And he ends up sitting down with French President Charles de Gaulle while en route to the Vienna summit. He was trying to drum up support. And Kennedy, new to the world stage, takes advice from de Gaulle, who basically tells him, ignore the lightning rod statements and all the bullshit bravado. Keep it dialed in. Keep focusing on what's right, what you believe in. And don't get involved in the schoolyard bully shit. And de Gaulle, after the fact, would remark to his people that while Kennedy had a youthful spirit, he was out of his league in terms of thinking that the United States carried a ton of influence in Europe. On June 4th of 1961, and keep in mind, whatever, whatever uh, advice that de Gaulle gave Kennedy went in one ear and right out his ass. June 4th of 61, Kennedy arrives in Vienna. He meets with Nikita Khrushchev, and Khrushchev dismantles Kennedy both mentally and emotionally almost immediately. A Khrushchev basically overtalked Kennedy, kept interrupting him, and bullied him for the entire three meetings that they had. And Kennedy would leave those meetings further enraged, once again asking, how on earth and when can we whack this motherfucker? That's what Kennedy wanted to do. And he wanted to do it, he wanted to whack Khrushchev without instigating a war. 
And this was Kennedy being outpaced, outthought, and tossed around the ring like a fucking rag doll. Kennedy had been warned by his own office, by his own people, by the president of Charles France. And he didn't listen to any of that shit. Instead of sitting back and just picking his spots, he allowed himself to be treated as a bitch and treated as soft. And that had a lot of consequences for Kennedy because back in Washington, they see this as a horrible mistake bowing down to the Soviets. An American president is supposed to be tough, no nonsense, and without hesitation will throw the first fucking punch. And so back in Washington, D.C., the CIA, the FBI, and the Democrats begin to wonder if Kennedy had any fucking clue of what he was doing. Khrushchev had remarked after all of this that he thought Kennedy was a smart guy, but he was a wimp. And he shouldn't be a leader. Maybe that's that Soviet bravado. And Kennedy only proves him right by allowing Khrushchev to walk all over him. So for his first major foreign issue, Kennedy fails in leaps and bounds. You know, at least Kennedy was able to get the bottom line out to Khrushchev that he proposed a treaty between Moscow and East Berlin. And Kennedy explains to Khrushchev, Khrushchev, that any interference with the United States at the West Berlin access rights would be considered an act of war, to which Khrushchev laughed loudly in his face. Kennedy would return to Washington pissed. He looked terrible amongst his own peers, uh, be in the Democrats and Republicans in the country. Not long after he, tur- he returned, Russia announces a plan to sign the treaty with East Berlin. However, a third-party occupation right and either sector was thrown out. And it was basically Khrushchev saying, go fuck yourself. Kennedy had failed again. And Kennedy was beyond exacerbated, and he held meetings about the beginning of the process for preparing for nuclear war. He wanted the American population to prepare for it, and those in Washington were immediately shitting themselves. Not only had Kennedy failed on a dozen different levels to handle this the right way, But on the world stage, he looks like a punk. And he looks like he's unprepared for world issues. And rather than lament and nurse the baby, so to speak, he wanted all out war. There was no barometer for Kennedy. Most presidents pick up, they try to to capitulate on a certain couple things, but they always get to the point where it's like, we don't want this to get out of control. Kennedy just goes from zero to 100. You know, that's just the way Kennedy was. And it was uh, with Kennedy was either everything is great or all hell is going to break loose. And many of people over the years have uh, speculated that that John F. Kennedy was bipolar. And his medication regimen didn't help that. And as as you know, may know or may not know, he was taking sedatives nonstop. And many in government worried that Kennedy was on too much medication and off his fucking rocker and that he would end up destroying the country. Now, you may say, why is this important? And it's important and so that you can understand how quickly Kennedy infuriated the people who really run this country. And it's not the Senate. It's not the president. It's wealthy men. Men who have run this country since its birth, the Rockefeller types. And they worried that Kennedy was going to destroy the country, but most importantly, destroy the financial markets and everything in between. And that's all it takes. That's all it takes. And as they say, the world's a stage, and on opening night, Kennedy shit the bed. And Kennedy's paranoia begins to sort of get out of control. A few weeks after Russia announces the treaty, Kennedy watches in awe as 20,000 terrified fucking Germans flee from East Berlin to West Berlin. And people are in terror over the statements from Russia. Kennedy immediately begins to have meetings to try to find a way to stop this before it gets out of hand. But he should have done that the first fucking time. But in reality, Kennedy was less worried about those 20,000 people than he was about this country. Which is his goddamn job. Instead of placing a call through channels or trying to work an issue out, Kennedy once again over fucking reacts and he overreacts with Dean Acheson who was a secretary of state and they order up a huge military buildup with both this country and NATO allies Kennedy would add 31 billion dollars to the defense budget he orders an additional 200,000 troops 
And Kennedy would Kennedy would state to the American public that any attack on West Berlin would be an attack on the United States. While that speech would receive receive resounding approval, it terrified the shit out of everybody in this country, and it especially terrified the living fuck out of the CIA. And I personally give credit for Kennedy taking a fucking stance. All right, you got a fucking backbone. And he's basically telling Russia, okay, you go ahead and dare and watch what the fuck I do. That's all this is, is a dick-waving contest. It took balls. I give Kennedy that. But it was also very stupid and fucking dangerous. As a reaction to that, Russia and East Berlin would block off interest into West Berlin, which is exactly what Kennedy didn't want. And anybody who then wanted to flee got fucked. Then they erected barbed wire all over the place and began to reinforce and upgrade the Berlin Wall. At first, Kennedy thought that this was just posturing. But remember, this is what he didn't want. But now he's like, oh, well, it's just posturing. And he ignores it at first. But finally, when the people, and this is what's crazy fucking insane. When the people in West Berlin began to talk to the press and began to posture that their faith in Kennedy was gone, that's when he wants to fucking react. He cared more about what people thought about him than what the fuck was the right thing to do. And so what does Kennedy do? Instead of picking up the phone and just saying, hey, listen, Khrushchev, we don't like each other. We don't, whatever it is, let's just move on. No, no, no. He sends Lyndon Johnson and Lucius Clay, along with military commanders to East Germany, to intentionally fucking infuriate uh, Khrushchev. And he makes sure that Johnson and the military commanders drive through Russian checkpoints just to show Russians that the United States isn't going to back down. What the fuck would he have done if they killed him? And this would be known or become to be known as the Berlin crisis. And I know we said we weren't going to get too too detailed about that. And and I hope it wasn't too boring, but it's just the beginning of the Cold War drama. And it was about to get a hell of a lot fucking hotter, hotter in the Oval Office for John F. Kennedy. Meanwhile, with all this going on, what was the little piss ant doing? Oh, yeah, he was still going after the mafia. And as we said, Bobby had pretty much neutered J. Edgar Hoover by that point. And you now see why. Hoover complained to Bobby that organized crime is not the overwhelming fucking issue. This shit with the Russians was much more dangerous, and Hoover believed that Russians were sending spies to the United States, and he would have been correct. Bobby needed to shift his focus, but he refused. And Bobby then establishes the Get Hoffa Squad. Even though Hoffa had been ousted, Kennedy wouldn't stop. So, between Hoffa and Kennedy... The two made threats publicly back and forth at each other, and they both levied accusations. And it came to a head on July 7th of 61, when Jimmy Hoffa suddenly gets reelected as the Teamsters president. Kennedy went apeshit, claiming in the papers that his stance had not changed, and that Hoffa was his primary target, target as it always had been. And what the American public didn't know, and wouldn't find out till a year later, And I don't know if many people know this or not, but Kennedy, Bobby the little shit, got so enraged that Hoffa had won re-election, he went to Hoffa's office and stormed in the front door and began making threats. Hoffa stood up, laughed in his face, and had him dumped on his fucking head outside of his office. Take that, you little shit. That, That really happened. So there was zero love lost between the two of them. So what does Bobby do? Well, here are some stats. The organized crime section in the Justice Department rose by 300% above 1961, and convictions of organized criminals grew to 350%. He celebrated the coordination of the FBI, the Secret Service, the IRS, and 23 other federal law enforcement agencies that helped him compile information on the nation's 1,100 top racketeers. There were more than 60 federal lawyers on his team, up from 17 in 1961. Five of the administration's anti-racketeering bills pushed by RFK were passed into law by Congress in 61, and they had led to the FBI to pursue 852 new cases against hoodlums and grand juries to indict 134 defendants in federal courts. The number of suspected hoods indicted reached 350 in 1962, compared with 49 in 1960. 
and recent convictions won by Kennedy's prosecutors included mobsters like Anthony Tony Ducks Corallo, Carmine Galante, and John Ormento, Frankie Carbo, and Frank Palermo, and Alfred Sica. Kennedy used warrantless wiretaps, which were illegal, to build information. And then an interesting tidbit, and I should have mentioned this a few weeks back, but 1958, when Bobby was beginning to go after the mafia, and keep in mind, this was prior to all hell breaking loose, Bobby announced at a Thanksgiving dinner to his family, he stood up, he raised a glass and says, I'm going to go after organized crime in the unions. Joe Kennedy stood up and went fucking ape shit. And he started screaming at Bobby in front of everybody at the table. He called Bobby stupid, ignorant, and having no understanding of how the goddamn world works. He not only was an imbecile, but he had no respect for his brother, what his brother might want to do politically, or the Kennedy family. So this is Joe taking a stance of, hey, motherfucker, we're going to need these guys. Stop your bullshit. Don't even go there. And Joe knew all too well that John would need those union-backed mob votes down the line. And he told Bobby, knock the fuck off. Bobby didn't listen and started anyway, which is likely why Joe Kennedy requested to meet with Frank Sinatra in 1958-59 because he knew what was coming. So let's, let's get an agreement with these pricks before Bobby just starts going fucking nuts. And, and that's what I really think it was. And I think that Joe thought to himself, you know what, by the time this comes around, I could put Bobby in his place. So it makes more sense as to why Joe would make promises that he really couldn't deliver on. I don't think he initially, I don't think initially he did it intentionally. I really don't. I think he thought he could control his fucking son. What he should have done is wait for Bobby to turn his fucking head and blackjack him about a dozen fucking times, knock some fucking sense into him. But I think that Joe carried, cared more about the optics of his family and he cared more about what John's future might look like than their lives or their safety. And Bobby had started looking into the unions and to the mafia before it was even known to the mob. So in effect, Joe makes this deal full well knowing that Bobby was already scheming behind the scenes. And Joe used the mafia and played them like a goddamn fiddle in the end. And how we can establish that as the truth is because Joe forces John to hire Bobby as the attorney general. And that's what takes us to one second thing. Well, Joe was trying to do the right thing because he knew he was going to need the union votes. But he know then you move ahead a year or two, he gets voted. And Joe, automatic, or Joe automatically knows Bobby's going to do this shit anyway. Make him attorney general. That way he's untouchable. That's what, they, that's, that's what I think the line of thinking was. That's what I really truly think that the line of thinking was. So if Joe cannot control Bobby, why the fuck force John's hand? Well, Joe got what he wanted from the mob, right? So now he sicks Bobby on him in order to insulate himself, to insulate Bobby and the rest of his family. And it was an epic move. Uh, he, he's the Irish Carlo Gambino as far as I'm concerned, but it's a move that both his children would suffer and his family would suffer for. However, if Kennedy thought his presidency by this point had had a really bad start, he had no idea what the fuck kind of shitstorm was coming his way in terms of Cuba. However, in order to, uh, to, to fully sort of get a background, we have to go back in time a bit and explain the mob Cuba and how all of that began. And so we're going to segue into an organized crime for the rest of this show, uh, which is going to lead us to the Bay of Pigs and more insanity within the Kennedy administration. So the mafia's expansion into Cuba began in the 1920s, uh, and it began with rum running and more. And guys like Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, Lucky Luciano, and Frank Costello were using Cuba as a middle ground for pretty much about everything. And that is one of the reasons why Cuba was a destination, as we have talked about a million times on this show. And Luciano had been moving drugs since his teens, and he wanted to use Cuba as a port of call. And he knew that if they could use Cuba as a point of distribution, along with Costello controlling the Coast Guard, narcotics would reach American shores without a problem, 90 miles off the American coast. So look at Cuba not only as a port for narcotics and gambling, but the island was actually one big front company for the mafia at the end of the day. The Cuban Empire really wouldn't really start until 1933. In fact, Luciano established, and a lot of people don't know this, but Luciano established five mob families of Cuba. The Luciano family, the Lansky family, the Battisti family, and the Traficante family, and the Barletta family. Those were the five mob families that were recognized as far as controlling things in Havana. Okay, uh, These were the five families allowed to operate within Cuba without any issue. 
Other families or factions were banned from controlling what happened there. They could have interest, but they couldn't control shit. But eventually, that would change down the line. Uh, Amoletto Battisti was responsible for setting up headquarters in Havana in those early days, and he did so through bribes and by taking over secret ownerships of hotel. Barletta, who was an, actually an Andragata member from Calabria, he was there to oversee Benito Mussolini's interests in America. So in other words, Mussolini had interests in American businesses and other things, and Barletta was the guy who took care of his action. In 1933, who do you think was in charge of Cuba? Fulgencio Batista. That's who was in charge. He had joined the army at 18 and rose through the ranks. By 1933, he was promoted to corporal. And it wasn't enough for Batista, and he actually leads an uprising called the Sergeant's Revolt. And the reason is pretty basic. He felt that along with others, the policies of Gerardo Machado during the Great Depression had really destroyed Cuba. Many politicians called for Machado to resign, and he wouldn't budge. So Batista and other military men banded together with college students, and the revolt was fucking on. Batista would lead his men to discuss the disadvantages of the military and that they were not paid fairly and the country was getting poorer and poorer. After the murder of Miguel Rodriguez, Batista was irate, and he, along with his group, created a manifesto asking for many things, including respect, dignity, more benefits, and he charged that all the military should rebel. It picks up steam, and it works. And without getting into all of the Cuban history, it more or less, Batista took over. Maybe not in title, but in name, he was running shit. And he would have his puppet presidents until he officially could take office in 1940. Well, until he actually did. So in other words, Batista was the main man in Cuba. And the mob needed a guy in Cuba they could trust, who they could control, and that man was Batista. And almost from day one, the mafia controlled him. And it would last from 1933 through 1959. So for some 14 years, Luciano, Costello, Lansky, and others made millions and millions and millions of dollars through prohibition. And before, a lot of guys made their millions and just didn't have a way to make money. So if they didn't legitimize or save it, they were busted financially. Luciano and Lansky saw a lot of gambling places were getting hit in New York. Uh, there were also the, the Dutch Schultz bullshit problems in Harlem. And Lansky was asked by Luciano to go look for another base of operations for uh, gambling operations, which actually lead Lansky to Cuba to begin with. Havana had always been an island of fun and sun and gambling, and when Batista took control, he also wanted to rebuild the island to become a destination in a gambling mecca, sort of like the Monte Carlo of the Caribbean, right? Or just Monte Carlo. And that was the same exact thing that the mafia wanted, too. So while the mob was already in Cuba and doing small things, it really wasn't until 1939 that Batista is really all in with the boys, as he asks Meyer Lansky to come and revamp Havana's Oriental Park horse track. So Lansky flies in with Lou Smith from New England to help oversee it. And once the track was done, many began flying into Cuba to see the track, and many were spending tons of money on the track and the nightlife, which Batista was getting huge kickbacks from. From there, Lansky began to move along with others to purchase hotels, revamping them uh, from bootlegging money and, they be, and also uh, illegal contracts, and they begin to attract a lot of tourists, and they begin to attract millionaires who all wanted the best amenities, the sun, the fun, the gambling, the debauchery, etc. So by 1940, the mafia had in fact helped Cuba escape economic oblivion, at least optically. And the island was booming, at least optically, like never before. And it would start a very long friendship between Bautista and the, the mob. Not only would the mafia have their conference there in 1946, but they would establish a base of operations for narcotics. And Bautista was all in with them. And he got massive kickbacks from the mafia for all of their operations. In many ways, the mafia just took over the island and Batista got uber rich doing it. And Batista, who had never run for office, just absorbed power, used the influence of the mafia and the boom in business to hold elections, which he won easily in 1940. In 1944, there would be another election and Batista would handpick his successor, Dr. Ramon Grau San Martin. Martin hated gambling and did all he could to try to end it, so we can't have that prick in office. And by 1948, Dr. Carlos Prio Scosaros was handpicked by Batista, and he was even more corrupt than Batista was. And Batista had enough, and by 1952, he just stepped back into the role and took it over for himself. And one of the first jobs that he does is to call Meyer Lansky, and he offers him a position as gambling minister of Cuba and pays him $25,000 a year for that position. 
And it was a name bully. Lansky really didn't do shit. It was just a kickback, nothing more. Lansky would fly back to Cuba and would begin to build the Montemarte Club. Uh, it was an elegant state-of-the-art place, but there was an issue. Well, a casino was a hit. Every night, Lansky's customers would cash in their chips and hustle off to catch a floor show at the outdoor gardens of the Tropicana or at the Capri's Red Room nightclub, which was controlled by Santo Traficante. Both nightclubs offered larger and more comfortable settings. So to compete, Lansky persuaded Batista to give him a piece of Cuba's national treasure, the Hotel Nacional, built in the 1930s. The Nacional was where the cream of Cuban society went to basically get drunk. Under Lansky's uh, sort of idea, a wing of the Nacional's grand entrance hall was refurbished to include a bar, a restaurant, a showroom, and a casino. Lansky brings, o brings his brother Jake, and he puts him in charge of the room which by the spring of 1957 was bringing in as much cash as the biggest casinos in Las Vegas. In 1955, the Batista government passed a law granting a gaming license to anyone who invested $1 million in a hotel or $200,000 in a new nightclub. And he meant anyone. Unlike the procedure for acquiring a gaming license in Vegas, this provision exempted venture capitalists from background checks. As long as they made the required investment, they were provided the public matching funds for construction, a 10-year tax exemption, and duty-free importation of equipment and furnishings. Although Batista's aim was to create new jobs, he basically just gutted the labor laws to allow casino owners to bring their American uh, gangster friends. Under the Batista-Lansky administration, Havana was ripe for foreign investments, especially for uh, the glut of illegal earnings that Lansky and his friends had accumulated from bootlegging numbers and other rackets. The FBI was developing new ways of tracking down dirty money to gangsters with loads of tainted cash, and Havana looked like a stable of offshore depository for the mob. And the climate was so attractive that Lansky decided to build his own hotel, the Riviera, on the Malacone, Havana's wide boulevard along the seawall, in case you've never been there or don't know. So in 1957, it rose over the horizon like a fucking beacon, advertising the city as a refuge from the law. Lansky became, becomes a successful businessman and, without, uh, and not, not without merit. He'd rig, he would rid the casinos of card sharks and cheats, offering legit games to attract high rollers. His hotel had the best food on the island, and it was the only one with air conditioning. So the bromance between Lansky and Batista was insane. However, Lansky knew one thing, and that was how to make serious money. Because of Lansky, Havana became a destination of choice for thousands of Americans, be it famous and tourists alike. Tony Bennett sang at the San Susi. Ginger Rogers opened to the Copa. Nat King Cole played the Tropicana. Frank Sinatra and John Lang were regulars at the Hotel Nacional. Like anything good, there's bad places too. While Havana, was a, while, while Havana was booming, everything outside of Havana was poor, dirt poor, and barren, lawlessness. Everything Batista made went right into the capital. And not other needed places where people were truly suffering. And the biggest thing the mob got was freedom to do whatever the fuck they wanted and not spend their own dime doing it. Batista pilfered millions from government funds or hotel construction and spent millions more reclaiming valuable waterfront real estate from the ocean. Construction of Lansky's Riviera went for about $18 million, while the Hotel Continental cost 20 The $14 million Capri, which housed Traficante's Red Room nightclub, was the only hotel that did not receive any money from the government. Batista wanted Cuba to be more like Monte Carlo. And then he ends up getting Conrad Hilton to come to Cuba. And Hilton had refused to come to Cuba, worried the Cuban unions would just destroy everything. But he really didn't know who was actually in control, and that was Batista and the mob. If Hilton worried about spending any money to build his hotel, he didn't need to worry about that because Batista fronts it. Batista, just like a mob boss, pilfered union funds to pay for the Hilton Hotel, costing $23 million. 650 rooms of luxury accommodations were financed by the pension funds of the Cuban Restaurant Workers Union. Finally, the cha finally. Hilton agrees. Hell, you're going to pay for everything? Okay. And they became Cuba's biggest hotel. So while Batista was freewheeling free his ass off, someone was watching. And they were watching from the jungles. Someone who saw Batista as a pig, exploiting illegal money and hurting those on the island. And there was a massive 
economical gap in Cuba. Either you had everything or you had nothing. People were starving. And that man's eyes were black as coal. And that man was Fidel Castro. Castro had wanted to advance his own agenda and only saw one way to do it. On July 26 of 53, he and a small band of guerrillas attacked the Moncada and Bayamo military barracks in Oriente province at the eastern end of the island, giving a name to Castro's revolutionary July 26 movement. Batista would end up capturing Fidel Castro and tried him. Castro would get 15 years in prison, but would be out in less than a year and a half. And that was a horrible fucking mistake. In 1954, Batista ran a rigged election in an effort to look good. He gave amnesty to political prisoners. And Castro gets let out as a result of that. And Castro takes advantage of that freedom by founding a guerrilla training camp 20 miles outside of Mexico City. In late 1956, he embarked with an expeditionary force of 81 men in an ill-equipped boat, the Grandma, that he had acquired in Mexico. They sailed to Cuba and landed at Los Colorados Beach on the southwestern coast of the Oriente province. Castro's forces would be attacked by the Cuban military, but he and his 20 men survived by escaping into the wooded mountains of the Sierra Mestra. And that's where we're going to stop today. And that's because we're, what's about to come next week is really the rise of Fidel Castro. Not only is he taking over, but he's tossing out the mafia on their asses. And they're about to lose hundreds of millions of dollars. And the mafia tries to parlay money into a friendship with Castro. But he doesn't want it. He wants them out. The mafia is pissed on losing out. But there's going to be a coup disgust. And promises get made that if they go along with this idea, they might have their precious little island once again. It could be all theirs. The problem is they're being lied to and they just don't fucking see it. So join us next week on another episode of the Kennedy Crime Family. Have a great weekend. I'm going to enjoy the fuck out of my birthday on Monday by doing nothing. Hooray for me, 46. Hey, I made it to 46. A lot of people, I never thought I'd make it to 26, but here we are. That's going to be it for this week. We'll see everybody next week on Mob Talk Radio.